In this video, we'll talk about anxiety and depression medications. We will start by explaining the pathophysiology of both depression and generalized anxiety disorder. First, for depression, we need to know the functions of norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. For serotonin, it regulates mood and social behavior and regulates appetite and digestion, sleep, and memory. For norepinephrine, it regulates body's stress response and helps to regulate sleep, alternus, and blood pressure. For dopamine, it is responsible for the reward-motivated behavior and in regulating body movements. Now in depression, we have decreased brain levels of these neurotransmitters or desensitization or downregulation of their receptors. This will cause the symptoms of low mood, changes in appetite, sleep disturbance, agitation, fatigue, and difficulty concentrating. Now, in generalized anxiety disorder, it's quite the opposite. The autonomic nervous system of anxious patient is hypersensitive and overreacts to various stimuli. The locus cerulus may have a role in regulating anxiety at its activate norepinephrine release and stimulate the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. But the chronic noradrenergic overactivity downregulates the alpha adrenal receptors which mediate the action of norepinephrine. Also, we have the amygdala, which is the fear center. It will be overstimulated to anxiety triggers. The symptoms for generalized anxiety disorders will be excessive anxiety and worry, increased muscle acts or soreness, impaired concentration, irritability, difficulty sleeping, and restlessness. Now, let's see our medications and how it can treat anxiety and depression. First, we have the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like fluxetin, paroxetin, and citalopram. They inhibit the uptake of serotonin into the presynaptic neuron, resulting in higher concentration for serotonin, which will help in depression. For anxiety, serotonin will inhibit the activity of amygdala. They are generally chosen as first-line antidepressants because of their relative safety in overdose and their improved tolerability compared to other agents. Adverse effects include headaches, sweating, GI adverse effects, changes in weight, and sleep disturbances. All SSRI have the potential to cause serotonin syndrome, especially when used with other highly serotonergic drugs or monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Serotonin syndrome may include the symptoms of hyperthermia, muscle rigidity, sweating, chronic muscle twitching, and changes in mental status. Second, we have the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or the SNRI. They include venilofaxin, duloxetin, and they inhibit the reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine. The most common side effects of venilofaxin are nausea, headache, sexual dysfunction, dizziness, and sedation. At high doses, there may be an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. GI side effects are more common with duloxetin including nausea, dry mouth, and constipation. Deloxetin is a moderate inhibitor of CYB2D6, so it may increase concentration of drugs metabolized by this pathway. Now we'll talk about the tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, imipramine, and narcriptyline, but their use are diminished because of the availability of equally effective therapies that are safer in overdose and better tolerated. They inhibit both the uptake of the norepinephrine and the serotonin, but the extra thing here is that they block adrenergic, muscarinic, and histaminic receptors, which are responsible for their side effects. Now because of the muscarinic blocking effect, it can cause blurred vision, dry mouth, urinary retention, sinus tachycardia. For the alpha adrenergic receptor blocking action, it can cause orthostatic hypotension dizziness, and reflex tachycardia, and imipramine is the most likely to cause orthostatic hypotension. Because of the histaminic receptor blocking action, it can cause sedation and weight gain. Now let's talk about the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, like phenylazine. Normally, the monoamine oxidase function as a safety valve when there is an excess of norepinephrine, serotonin, or dopamine, it deaminate and degrade them. So inhibiting it will allow neurotransmitters to escape degradation and accumulate. But there is a severe and unpredictable side effects due to the drug-food and drug-drug interaction that limit their use. For example, we have tyramine, which is contained in food like aged cheese and meat or smoked fish. It is normally inactivated by this enzyme. So individuals who receive these medications are unable to degrade tyramine and tyramine will accumulate. The problem is that the tyramine causes the release of large amount of stored catecholamines from the nerve terminal, resulting in hypertensive crisis with signs and symptoms such as stiff neck, tachycardia, cardiac arrhythmia, seizures, and possibly stroke. So patients must be educated to avoid tyramine-containing food. 
Other side effects include drowsiness, orthostatic hypotension, dry mouth, and constipation. Due to the risk of serotonin syndrome, the use of these medications with other antidepressants like SSRI is contraindicated. There should be a washout period for at least two weeks before the other type is administered. Now I'll talk about the atypical antidepressants, which are a mixed group of agents that have actions at several different sites. They will have several effects on serotonin receptors, which are the 5-HT receptors. First, we have mirtazapine, which has a dual mode of action that acts by antagonizing the adrenergic alpha-2 receptors as well as blocking the 5-H2 receptors, which are receptors that are responsible for the anxiety symptoms. It also blocks histamine receptors, so it has a sedating effect. Increased appetite and weight gain are the most common side effects. Then we have trazodones and nifazodone, which are weak inhibitors of the reuptake of serotonin, but their therapeutic effect comes from blocking the postsynaptic 5-H2A receptors which are also responsible for the anxiety symptoms. They are potent histamine blockers, so they have a sedating effect. In fact, trazodone is commonly used as an off-label for insomnia. They can cause orthostatic hypotension because they antagonize the alpha-1 receptors. Now we'll talk about the benzodiazepines, which are effective and most frequently prescribed for acute anxiety. They are the most effective for the somatic and autonomic symptoms of anxiety, whereas antidepressants are used for the psychologic symptoms like worrying. The mechanism of action is we have GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitters. Now, benzodiazepines target GABA receptors and enhance its activity. It should not be stopped up properly to avoid benzodiazepine withdrawal symptoms and rebound symptoms. Now, because of their addiction potential, they should not be used for a long period of time. Now, we have chlorazepate, which is high lipophilic and have a rapid anti-anxiety effect, but a shorter duration. Then you have lorazepam and oxazepam, which are less lipophilic, but have slower onset and longer duration of action. They are not recommended for the immediate relief of anxiety. Most common side effects are CNS depression, disorientation, confusion, and anterior grade amnesia, which is a temporary impairment of memory. And that's the end of this video. Please don't forget to subscribe, share, and like.